Okay, Blake, have you seen any celebrities around town in Nashville? Yeah, I've actually bumped into a few at the movie theater. Welcome to the Church Gear Podcast, where we pull the tech director out of the booth and onto the stage to share the most outlandish stories and hidden wisdom from the tech trenches. And now, here are your hosts. I'm your co-host, Blake Hodges, the only person that can talk about something he knows nothing about for hours at a time. And I'm here with your other co-host, my favorite boss, whose name started with the letter T, Toby Walters. That's uh, very ominous. Started with the letter T, like that could have gone a lot, a lot of different ways. I'm saying bosses whose names start with the letter T, of which I've had more than one, actually. This isn't a bit. Oh, you so are my I'm favorite. Your favorite boss of bosses whose names start with the letter T. Yep, of all my bosses wow. whose names start with a T. Wow. You're my favorite. Uh backhanded compliment, maybe, or a side-handed? No, you're literally the top in a category in which there are other bosses. <laughs> so Wow. All right. That's a real stretch, Blake. But okay, going back to the celebrity sightings. So we did a company lunch uh, a couple months back, and we went to one of our favorite taco places. And I think it might have been somebody's birthday. We were celebrating something. And so we went to lunch, we get out of the car and we're walking into the parking lot. And as you, I'm sure you've seen many times in Nashville, there was band looking dudes. Yeah. You're like, are you trying to make it? Or have you already made it? And you're like, just chilling now. It was, it was that vibe. Or you didn't make it and you're just holding on to that whole vibe for dear life. But these guys, they look legit. And so it was four of them. Clearly, corner of my eye, I looked over and I'm like, oh, band. And then like it triggered in my brain, like, I know that band. And so I look back and who do you think it was, Blake? It was Need to Breathe. It was Need to Breathe. I love Need to Breathe. This is one I'll get. I I get this band. I know this band. I've listened to many of those songs in the car. Love them. Love them. So I shout across the parking lot. Nothing like, you know, a 13-year-old girl seeing Justin Timberlake for the first time. Need to breathe. And they kind of wave. They're like, oh, hey, guys, how are you? And I mean, they're super cool. They're super nice. They talked to us for a few seconds. I'd actually gotten a call from the bass player a while back because he had gear for sale. He's like, hey, I I hear you guys buy gear. I've got all the studio equipment. It did not work out, but I just, you know, name dropping. I'm I want our audience to understand how cool I am. Well, I'm and I and I try to facilitate that as well. Um, But there is this moment where we do that and then we end up behind them in line for tacos. Yeah. So we're standing next to them at tacos. And of course it, it just feels like we're all on the same level at this point. It's not, you know, rock stars and average Joe's. It's just people in line for tacos. And honestly, I was just telling myself in my head, be chill, be chill, be chill. Don't ask for a selfie. Show them you are a native Nashvillian. You're the only one in this group who's a native Nashvillian. You don't ask for photos. And I just stayed chill. So yeah, that was really fun. So we're on the ride back from lunch going back to the warehouse. And so we're talking about celebrity sightings. And of course, you know, in Nashville and Franklin, there's just a ton of celebrities that live here. And so we're, we're trading stories and a few people have seen, you know, a few of us have seen different people around town. And then we kind of like make the segue of, well, do you consider, you know, any Christian artists celebrities? Cause you can see a lot of Christian artists around Franklin. Totally. And honestly, it's like celebrity to you. Like, who would you be jazzed about seeing? So our guest today, I won't say his name because we have a big reveal coming, even though it's in the podcast title. Maybe. At least we might not even know yet. But anyways, he says, well, on that, you know, on that line of thinking, I would definitely say I would consider it a celebrity sighting if I saw Stephen Curtis Chapman. And I'm like, you know what, dude? Like when that record came out, I was in eighth grade, The Great Adventure. Like that was youth group. That was like youth group frenzy back in 1993. So I'd say definitely I would consider Stephen Curtis Chapman a celebrity as well. Totally. He's on billboards in Nashville uh, on the inter- like when you're on the interstate every now and then like that's if you're on a billboard, you're at least a celebrity. I'd say so. So we get back to the warehouse and it isn't five minutes after we have this conversation and I get a text from a friend of mine. Um, It's actually uh, the husband of a friend of mine. And so he texts me and says, hey, my wife told me you guys buy gear from churches. Do you also buy gear from like artists or other entities? Um, I work with a client who has a lot of gear. And so I said, you know, sure. Like, do you have a list of this gear? Can we, you know, I'd love to chat with you about it. 
And he said, I don't have a list, but if you have time at some time, you know, he lives in Franklin and that's where a warehouse is. And I said, well, I've got an hour and a half right now. So the guy said, sure, like, come on over and check it out. So he texted me the address and I drove over and I pull up at Stephen Curtis Chapman's house. This is unreal. At this point, I'm at my house working remote and I'm, I'm seeing the text thread of the story and I'm like, this, this is not, this can't be real. And so I'm texting the poor guy that just told me like half an hour ago, I'd have, you know, a celebrity sighting would be Stephen Curtis Chapman. I'm like, uh, I'm accidentally at his house right now, 30 minutes later. And so uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman has this just amazingly beautiful property out in Franklin. He's got this gorgeous house and then it's a farm. And then he's got this huge barn on the farm that's been renovated. And so I go in and the first things I see are like these huge set decorations and they're, they're not for him. They're for his son's band. Do you know who that is, Blake? You know what? I was so proud of my need to breathe one, but I, I don't know this one. It's Colony House. Oh, okay. I recognize that name. So two of his sons are in Colony House and they are just an awesome young rock band as well. And I'm kind of geeking out as well because I love their music. And then uh, my friend takes me up to kind of their their storage area. So, I mean, he's got old Otari radar systems. He's got all this recording gear. He's got a bunch of set design stuff like SCC and giant letters with light bulbs. And there's a piano, there's guitars, there's all these amps. Um, so it was fun to kind of see all this gear that they wanted to offload. Now, I will say that they haven't called us back mm. ever again. Mm. And I'm like, is it something I said? Was it, did they get the sense that one of our guys would just like freak out? Yeah. And I can't believe you didn't take our guy to see his guy. I was going to, as soon as they called me back, as soon as they were like, yep, come get SCC's gear, but they never called back. So I'm mm-hmm. going to have to apologize to our guest, but it's not my fault. So speaking of our guest, Blake, our guest has started touring when he was uh, front of, at 18 years old at front of house. He mixed for Chick Corea, Yellow Jackets, Patty Austin, and many more. He produced over 5,000 radio programs. 5,000? He was once asked to leave with the band he had just mixed and go on the road with them immediately. Leave with the band. That that sounded much more ominous when you started. I was hoping it would sound sultry. Like, man, they just they loved this guy so much. They're like, you're one of us now. Come on. Um, he did the sound design for a syndicated TV show. He did four seasons of a kid's podcast. And he was once electrocuted so bad it shot him back 10 feet, earning him the nickname Sparky. Our guest and my favorite best friend, Brian Saganaro. Hey, guys. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks for having me, as everyone says. Of course, uh, our listening audience doesn't know you actually produce this show. Well, yeah. So at least I can edit my own voice now. Yes. Something I've always wanted to do. Are you going to make your episode the best episode we've ever done? It it will be the best edited voice. Uh, yeah, episode. Definitely. Best one. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. Actually, after hearing some of the other guests that we have had on this thing and editing uh, editing some of the other shows that we have recorded already, I I very honestly don't feel up to the par of a lot of the people that we have on this show. That is crap, because no one puts their the company on their back like you. Nobody every- puts baby in a corner. There we <laughs> go. Nor Brian. <laughs> Yeah, of course, Blake doesn't know that reference. No, not a bit. No. We'll, we'll go on. Yeah. I don't know why yeah. you would leave a baby in a corner, but I'm not a parent yet. Maybe I'll find out. So, <laughs> All right, we got to figure out this lie, Blake. Yeah, okay. And we know Brian really well, so this is a little tricky. I know Brian. Yeah, I mean, let's see. I've known Brian now for a year, and then uh, you have known him since y'all were in high school. So Yes, it's been a long, it's been a hot minute. Been a hot minute. So, I like okay. Um, I mean, I know he's produced a lot of radio programs, so... I th- I think we can take that off the table. Hundred percent. the The podcast thing, the the TV show, now, um, the kids podcast. I mean, I know the the radio programs he was doing, and they weren't. I mean, they were Christian radio, but they weren't for kids. So I wonder if maybe that's included. I mean, would one of his kids have a podcast? Brian does have twenty kids. Yeah, I thought it was like more like False. thirty, but true. <laughs> False. That's it a feels lot like, of kids. It does yeah. feel like it sometimes. Yeah. No, only only four. Only okay. Four. So I mean. Goodness, that's more than the people sitting at this table. So they could have had a podcast. Okay, what else? All right. And I do feel like I've heard in a story about electrocution. So I I feel like that might actually been be true. He does work with a lot of wires all the time. Like there's sometimes when I'll I'll go back and he's he's working on a board and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of electricity, Brian. Don't die. Okay, I'm gonna say the kids podcast. How about you, Blake? 
I think he is trying to throw us off with the started touring front of house at 18. I bet it was 19 because 18 is really young. So I'm going to lock in at 18. Boy, both are wrong, actually. Uh, This is the first time. I did tour, (laughs) start touring at 18. um, And uh, I turned 19 quickly after I started tour, but it was still 18. Legit, you know. Um, No, the lie in there is actually uh, the electrocution. However, it's only kind of like a half lie. Um, So you're only half a liar. I'm only half lying. Brian is a good Christian, so he could only bring himself to halfway sin on this one. That's true. No, so the half lie, only, yeah, only half liar. The... um, the half lie there with the electricity is is I actually did uh, garner the nickname Sparky at one point in my life when I did a missions trip to India. And India's power grid is extremely uh, vulgar. Sketchy. It's terrible. <laughs> it's so bad. Um, it's volatile. I mean, you you can you will dip and like it's it's a mess. Anyway, uh, I did so. Uh, I was on tour doing a show uh, with people in India, and uh, their power grid was so bad. If you just all I had to do was touch the console, not anything. If I touch metal, I get shocked, um, and it was bad. So I got shocked ten times in one show, about fifty volts each. I could actually take my my voltmeter and touch the console, and it would read electricity coming off the top of it. Um, and uh, it was it was interesting. I ended up taking the <laughs> taking the pluck foam out of a case that I put my microphones in, and I gaffed it to my hand so I could touch the console to mix. Um, anyway, yeah, I did garner the nickname Sparky. The, the part of that's a lie in that is getting shot back 10 feet. I, I never actually like went backwards when I got shocked, but I definitely did. Um, and was this the uh, infamous trip to India where your body decided not to process anything? For yes. Two weeks? I, you had very, it, very it, little movement. I was there for, yeah, I think I was there for two weeks solid. And when I say solid, it was, that's what it was. It was two weeks well, your body so. was like, you know, I'm in a dangerous place. I'm getting electrocuted. I have to just, you know, draw up to survive. I oh, mean, that yeah. sounds that sounds dangerous to be working like that. It, it really was. Uh, when I finished the uh, finished the tour, I took one of the power strips that I had in line and pulled it apart, and the entire inside of it was melted. It was solid black. Like you couldn't tell what the wires and the insulation was. Um, it uh, destroyed the gear that I took on that tour with. It was rough. And you also took some fiber. Yes. Yeah. The next few days were. Some- some fiber cables, right? Fiber That's right. Cables. Wow. Okay. So I guess that explains how you got the nickname Sparky. Yep. Um, well, okay. Let's let's go back to the 18 because that's really young to to get started. So how did you actually get started in tech, and especially at that age? I mean, you were ba- barely even not a teenager. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I grew up in a very musical household. You know, my mom um, was the choir director at the church that we were. You know, the small church we grew up in in San Diego. Um, my um, sister. Uh, beautiful singer. Uh, my other sister is had a great voice. She's an actress. She loves theater. And and so we just, I just grew up around music. It was always on. It was always something that our house was doing. And um, I never really found my niche in music. You know, I could sing. It was kind of fun. But, um, but more than that, I, it was a random happenstance where you show up to youth group early. So I was going to a church in San Diego. Um, I was part of the junior high group. And I walked in and it was basically one of those You walk in early, it's like, hey, help us set up. And it's like, okay, cool, I'm here to help, no problem. And I start helping setting up. I was plugging in cables. And and then it was like, well, come back here, we'll teach you how to do the soundboard. And I just walked back there and started to learn. And, um, you know, next thing you know, in junior high, you're you're the guy. You're doing, you're mixing youth groups and things like that. And so I started in church. I started doing that. And then it was high school. I was doing it all through the high school group and bands. And then I started to do it at high school while I was in choir. I was in choir in high school, yes. Choir nerd. I know. Mm-hmm. Were you, hey, you weren't nerd. singing and mixing at the same time. Right? I would That's set it up. I would set it up and set like set the mix, and then I'd go in the choir and, and then sing, and then I come and tear it down when we did small shows. So yeah, I did. I did. It was kind of the same. I was not not at the exact same time, but I would do one and then go sing and then tear. Yeah. So that kind of a thing. So Brian's been juggling mini hats since he was a young kid, which explains why he's so good at doing it at church gear. <laughs> there you go. We've uh, it, it's a it's a constant struggle for most tech directors and most tech people. You're you're wearing a lot of hats. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Okay, so here's a fun question mm-hmm. for any tech. What was your first board? What was your first mixer you were mixing on? Oh man. Um, well, ooh, that's a great question. I um, I don't remember the board that was in the junior high 
or the high school groom room. I honestly don't remember. I mean, it, if if I can guess with the <laughs> at the era and the time, it was probably a Mackey of some sort. So that was know, the ticket back. Lord then. help us all. Um, but the one the one I remember the most was during my high school years. At high school, we had an old carbon, and it was a, I don't remember the model number. Oh, carbon. Oh man, the thing was heavy, and it was just it was so it was big. It was this huge, heavy carbon thing. The funny thing about it though, what I remember the most is, is in the, uh, like the, the armrest that was on the very bottom front of the thing, um, actually had a spring reverb built into it. So there was like built in effects on the board. Like an old Fender amp. Yeah. I mean, it was old analog thing, but you could dial in some reverb there. Um, but if you, (laughs) if you hit the console too hard, uh, at any point in time and it was all plugged in, man, you would hear that spring reverb, like, hit and it would man this huge clang sound come out of the speakers and so yeah you always kind of had to mix with your hands up like a piano player like you couldn't let had let your hands rest they all had to be up here blake do you know what spring reverb is i don't but i know that reverb is a thing that it's not summer reverb Mm. it's definitely spring Spring but uh, action in this case what uh sparky is referring to the spring reverb if it's like a physical spring in a box Mm -hmm. inside of whatever it is like guitar amps Back in the 60s, I mean, guitar amps forever have had spring reverb built in. But a, what he's describing, like, if you hit it too hard, those springs vibrate. And it's like, think of a thunder sound effect in a movie. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, that's not exactly. Great. Yeah. So you, you know, you had when you put it down on the desk, you had to give it a few minutes before you started to plug things in because that re- spring reverb was going full time. And I'm sure if the mains are up and the system's pumping, if you hit that spring reverb, oh, everybody would jump. I mean, it was, the, it was the loudest thing that would come out of the speakers at that time. I mean, it was it was obnoxious. Thank you, Carvin. Yeah. 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 God bless them. They make decent stuff. That was just one of the early boards that it wasn't the best. It is fun, though, to hear that you compare yourself to a piano player in that moment, because I do wonder, like, the more I learn about mixing, I'm like, I wonder if they do feel like they're playing an instrument, really. Oh, it's- 100%. Yeah. Uh, I, I know um, the most most of the uh, the best front of house guys are also musicians. And, you know, it's it, there's a saying, especially in the recording industry, you know, so you want to be, be able to be on both sides of the glass. You want to be in, in the booth mixing or recording but that same guy should be able to go on the other side of the glass pick up whatever instrument he needs and and play it at least decently um yeah music and mixing especially in audio it's they go hand in hand so uh you you know talking about playing piano do you do you play piano do you play another instrument says knowingly uh yeah he, he I'm gently knowingly. leading I know. you down a path yeah of a story. no i'm uh i i do i do play bass uh i love i love playing bass um it's a passion that i picked up when i was when i tried college for the second time that's a different story um and, uh, but <laughs> was that I, the time you succeeded <laughs> no no both times were were utter failure uh it was something that i realized i was just not cut for um some people Love it. Go for it. Good. This wasn't for me, but, um, but one thing I did garnish from that year was <laughs> that year. Uh, the one thing I garnished from that year was playing bass and I loved it, man. I love, I love my bass. I play a, an MTD, Michael Tobias design bass. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I miss it. I don't play it as much right now just because of the stage of life we're in, but yeah, it's something that I do. Love. Do you ever have the experience of playing bass in a uh, notable band? I of mean, sorts? I played. I played in a band in San Diego uh, for a while. I unfortunately only lasted about six months because I lost my my full time job and had to go back on tour. But um, yeah, it was a band called Whirl. Uh, well, who you, else was in that band? You might know about that band, Toby. I, I think you've you've at least heard of it, no. ladies and gentlemen. Um, you, Brian, was in my band. That's right. Yeah. And uh, Brian, what was my biggest complaint about you generally when you were in my band? Uh, I mean, the wardrobe was probably not rock star ish enough is what my guess was. See, our whole shtick with this podcast <laughs> is taking the tech director out of the booth and putting him on stage. But yeah. you've got to tell the tech director, untuck your polo, put on some jeans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the jeans was easy enough. The, the, the untucking the polo part was was the that was tricky for, for you. Yeah, that was hard for me. Yeah. OK, Brian. So uh, this brings to mind just a, a story for the ages. Yeah. We were leading worship. Um what was this? Maybe 2000, 2000, 2001, yeah, 2001 ish, probably. And we were leading at the rock church in San Diego. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they were at that time, they were meeting in the open air amphitheater at San Diego state. I remember that, but that venue was great. Yeah. So we did, 
I guess we we're doing a, a morning at the rock and they, they had two services at the open air amphitheater. Mm-hmm. And so we did our worship set and then they had a guest, um, guest musical act or group, uh, from Africa, like from Botswana or Zambia or one of those countries. Yeah. And so they're doing their very traditional African worship music. Right. And so they're singing these songs and then eventually they, they kind of get the, uh, the audience to, engage with them like everybody teach. loves our audience participation yeah, yeah. so yeah the group's teaching the audience a couple moves some clapping um so miles mcpherson pastor of the rock miles is i don't know he's probably six foot three just good looking athletic black guy like yep. former san diego charger yeah yeah and so he's hanging out side stage with us and watching this uh this group from africa and so he turns back to us and he, he asks us do you remember the question he asks us I think it, it had, it was along the lines of, uh, uh, disease. Do you guys know the disease? I it, was it. Yeah. He said like, are you, are you familiar with the disease? Yeah. And I look at him and I don't know why I knew what he was saying, but I was like the, the white man's disease. And he says, <laughs> yep, that's the one. Yep, That's it. <laughs> so he says, there is a gentleman right in the, right in the middle about, you know, 15 rows up. And we're like, we're talking a thousand people. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. That open air theater was huge. And he says, this man has the white man's disease. Like nobody I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and so this. we're like, Oh, we got to yeah. see this. Yep. So we kind of peek through the curtain and he points him out and there's, he's like, he's right up there. He's wearing a Bill Cosby sweater Yep. and points him out. And so I turned to miles Look at him. I say, Miles, that's my dad. Yep. <laughs> that was my dad that in a was, sea of a thousand people. Yep. Picked him out like a with yeah. the white man's disease. And and luckily it did not pass to me. I right. mean, as you guys know, I can dance oh, like no other. Incredibly. Yeah. I mean, so I remember my wedding. Yeah. I turn to I turn to Miles and I'm like, Miles, you have to tell this story when you go out to the microphone. He's like, I can't do that. I'd embarrass your dad. I'm like, if my dad lives for anything, it's public embarrassment. I, he's very comfortable in those environments. Yes. It's he pretty was amazing. a cheerleader in high school. Ah, I mean, I didn't know come that. on. Yeah. So I convince Miles to do this. So he walks on stage after the music's done and he tells a story and he points out my dad and in a thousand people, my dad stands up and takes a bow. <laughs> I mean, and the place erupted like crowds yeah. cheering the whole thing. They loved it. And, um, I, you're, I do remember that. Yeah. You're dead. And I, I think I, if I remember correctly afterwards, man, he was beaming ear to ear. Yeah. Like I'm, when we saw him like after the show. Taking he, pictures, he signing autographs, you know? Yeah. yeah. And this is the lineage I've, I've had to overcome. <laughs> no, no. That was one of the best days in your dad's life. And Toby's like, I finally facilitated it. Dad's proud of me. I got him on stage. Here I mean, he was, yeah, that was, that was a fun, that was a fun show. Love it. So Brian, now that we've covered what the disease is uh let's talk <laughs> let's talk about some info let's talk about learning some things okay um you've been doing this a while you've been yeah. doing this since you're 18 so i would assume you've had some mentors along the way uh tell us a, a big lesson that a mentor has taught you in the past oh man um ooh, big lesson you know um i think the the first thing that comes to mind is i had, I had an old boss of mine uh that i worked with for Actually, I didn't work for him very long. It was just a little over a year. Was this your favorite boss? Uh, no, no, de- definitely, definitely not my definitely favorite. Definitely not your definitely favorite not boss. Not my okay. favorite Did his boss name is... start with T? No, it didn't. It started okay. with a V. Actually. So different category. Yeah, mean. totally. Mm. Um, no, uh, and and he's still a dear friend, Vance Brashears. Uh, I worked with Vance for a little over a year um, as a system designer. Um, I would design audio systems for churches, buildings, things like that. Uh, and... Um, Loved it, but he is an incredible individual who's, um, his accolades are crazy. Lieutenant in the Marine Corps. I mean, he, uh, he's got a, like a bachelor's in physics or something. He's an acoustician. He's, I mean, the guy is just, he's the opposite of Blake. He's He's the opposite of me. (laughs) Well-rounded and equipped. Um, but he's, he's an amazing individual. Uh, and when he gets hired on to work with churches, he goes above and beyond when it comes to system design. He shows the church what it means to just conduct. Well, I'll go back to that. He shows he showed me what it was to conduct business with humility and with 
other people in mind. Um, you don't run people over, you stop to help them. And um, there was so many times where we would have meetings at churches and I would go with him uh, just as like one of the designers and things like that. He would take me along um, and he would inevit inevitably start asking the church about just how the, how is the church doing? How is your church body doing? What is what is making the church grow right now? What is your passion? And where, you know, where do, we, and it was, it had nothing to do with the system. It was all about him in an environment where he could pour into the people in front of him. Um, and, uh, and I mean, that was, that was so long ago, but I remember that vividly. Um, and it really struck a chord with me. I wanted to conduct myself um, in that same fashion. So I think, and it's funny cause that's not even really a, a tech related uh, I was about lesson. To, I was about to say, uh, or give you the chance to apply that to tech because the more podcasts we do, the more I hear of just good communication between uh, teams is sure. so important. And it sounds like he taught you how to put yourself in someone else's shoes. 100%. And listen to their side and really empathize with them. Well, and, and even especially in the tech world when it comes to churches, you know, I, I can't tell you how often you hear. Um, you know, the worship pastor and the tech, the head lead tech guy at odds, you know, they're not on the same page, they're, they're button heads. And, um, and it's, it's, there are many reasons behind it. And I mean, that could be a podcast on its own talking. All oh, it time, is. I've already got on the schedule. Fantastic. So the only other thing that I can, I can think of uh, with, um, well, the thing that comes from that is, is having that humility, having that humble spirit inside of you as a tech, uh, especially at a tech at a church, I mean, that is a servant's job. It is a servant's heart, a servant's heart mentality when it comes to what you do for that church. Nothing is is should be above you. No, I mean, if, if you're there, I mean, you're always there for, first, right? First and last out, that's what we do. So when you're the first one in and that guitar player is trying to, you know, haul his cab and his pedal and his guitar in, I mean, you are the guy that jumps up, runs the door, either holds the door or helps him halfway in, you know, um, you're part of that same team. He's a teammate, just like the guy who's running lyrics is your teammate. Um, so yeah, it's a big, it's a big lesson to learn in humility and having to build up, build up your team the best way you can. And Vance, Vance is the one that told me that. Absolutely. So then you started really young. Uh, you've learned a lot along the way. Yeah. Um, what is some advice you would give someone contemplating a job in tech? Because it seems like I keep hearing this repeating motif of, you know, I was just in the in the youth ministry, and they needed someone to help with the light or slides in the back. Yeah. And suddenly, like I'm talking to them, they're 45. Like that's a story. Yeah. And then uh, I serve on Wednesday nights at at our church, and they it's middle school ministry, and they said, hey, we need someone to volunteer to uh, run just to hit the slides in the back on the mm -hmm. tech. So let us know. And I thought to myself, someone's life in here just completely change. Someone's going to say yes. Very possible. And they don't realize they're about to become a tech director. <laughs> Very possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and it's only going to be eight years before they're the head tech director yeah, yeah, of these churches. Oh, it might be four or three. Like I mean, it's, it, there are so many churches that just need a guy who knows what they're doing, you know? Um, so the question would be like, what advice would what, I give? Yeah. Like if you were contemplating a job in tech, sure. um, and you're you're on the younger side. Mm -hmm. Maybe you maybe you're in high school right now, and you're thinking about it. You're poking around. Well, what advice would you give someone uh, on like you know if the job is for them or if it's not or, I mean that kind of thing. I mean, if you're interested in tech at all, like if if you look at that that front of house booth or the broadcast room or whatever it is at the church, and you look around and go, hey, that looks kind of neat. Like that's cool. Um, I will promise you right now that if you walked up, if that if that kid walked up to the tech director, the lead tech or whomever it is and asked if they needed help, the tech director might start crying because every tech director needs help, you know, and having somebody walk up and actually volunteer and not get voluntold um, mm. is an amazing, <laughs> is, it is an amazing feeling as a tech director. Um, so, you know, that's one. If, if you want to get involved, man, just go ask, just go ask the te tech director, Hey, I'm curious about this. I want to learn how can I get involved. Um, and then the beautiful thing about doing this in a church is um, you get that you get to kind of experience and and learn all three disciplines. You can get into audio, you can get into video, you can get into lighting. You can I mean, pick three. You know, pick one of them. And and um, if tech is is for you in any way, shape, or form, um, and you get into one of those three, it's like ooh. 
I, okay, I got the audio. That was kind of fun, whatever. But the video side of it, like the visual, the, the, um, you know, directing cameras and shading and things like that. It's like, that's really neat. Like you, you can find a path in it. Um, big time. And the church is a great way of learning, especially at a young age. Uh, tech directors should utilize youth rooms more often. I, in my personal opinion, that's my opinion. Um, uh, those tech directors should, should go into the youth at junior high and the high school, talk to these kids, see who's interested in it and train them at that point, you know, train them then, you know, because they're going to be there on Sundays. They're going to be there on Wednesdays or Thursdays, whatever the youth room, you know, the youth night is, um, they're going to be there. So pull them in, teach them, invest in them, invest in, you know, and you very well could like, I mean, you could be training your, um, you could be you know, training your replacement at that point. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Okay, Brian, um, you definitely have a heart for the church, especially small churches with limited budgets, limited resources. Yeah. Where should small churches with limited budgets start to improve their production? That's a really hard question to answer because every church is slightly different. Um, well, every, you're welcome then. Yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> um, We every, actually saved all our hard questions for you. Well, like they're all just in this episode. That's fine. It's not like my job depends on the answers. Um, I, <laughs> I, that's a hard question. That is really a question to answer because every church environment is slightly different. And when I say environment, that environment could be like the physical environment, the the shape of the room. They might have good gear. It just might not be used correctly because of the acoustics of the room. You know, if you walk into the center of an auditorium, snap your fingers and you hear it for four seconds, you have a problem. So You're probably in a Catholic church. Well, that, I mean, honestly, College Avenue Baptist Church, you know, that's a, in San Diego. That was um, a friend of mine was the tech director of that church for a long time. Um, and he fought those issues constantly. It was always like, hey, can we do this and this and this? And he's like, yeah, but it's not going to help. What's going to help is changing the acoustics of the room. So, I mean, it could be as simple as buying acoustic panels off of Sweetwater, putting them up on the walls where you think it, you need it, and just that that alone could be a huge improvement. Um, but then you get into the gear side of it. It's that whole you walk in and it's the old, again, Mackie, there's the Mackie 24, you know, um, sitting in the back. And it's like, okay, well, your speakers and your amps are okay. This is what's stopping you from making it better. And so it's, there's... They, there are so many links in that chain and any one of them could be this, the, the slight replacement of that could make it a, a hundred times better. If I think the biggest part is knowing someone and trusting them to come in, look at your setup and then taking their advice on it. So these days you are living your dream, I will say, since yes, I'm your boss, as the, you are the lead tech, the lead gear guru at Church Gear. So essentially every piece of gear that comes in the door at church gear goes under your supervision until it leaves church gear. Yes. Uh, give our audience just what are some of the fun pieces that have come in recently that you just, it's like Christmas morning to you. Oh my word. Well, I mean, every time we get a, a truckload of new gear, it's like Christmas morning because, um, you know, sometimes I get to see the gear list. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes we just, we open the door and start pulling out tubs and it's like, Ooh, you know, Hey, black magic. Like, Ooh, you know, look at, the, um, recently, uh, we picked up, I mean, <laughs> in, in a case full of other things I was unpacking and I pulled out this, this little, like a hard shell case, not big. It was like a two inch by four inch case kind of thing. Like a um, mini Pelican or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in a little zipper case, it was almost like something you would throw a big hard drive in or something. So yeah, it was, I opened it up and uh, there were two Neumann pencil mics, like KM 185s, I think. Um, that is, those are amazing. Those are fantastic mics. Uh, so um, that was fun. Um, we got some Teradex stuff uh, from, uh, I think it was that same church, the same plant that we picked up from. And, um, oh man. Yeah. I mean, we, it's amazing because, uh, a lot of this gear, even though it still could be very utilized, just that church in that season just doesn't have a use for it anymore. Um, and as much as we, you know, we love good gear. I love to see good gear, go to a church in a place that's going to use it and, and love it. You know, I mean, those, those Neumann mics could be a couple of amazing choir mics. They could be, I mean, you could use them as overheads. You could, you know, audience mics for heaven's sake. I don't know, but I mean, there's you could mic up your Kemper even with those. Things. Yeah. You could put it, yeah, put, <laughs> put the mic on the Kemper and, and, you know, get the solenoids um, switching from, yeah. One sample to the other. Okay. Brian, um, for all of our churches listening out there, yeah. if 
you could tell them like, hey, if anybody happens to uh, want church gear to come pick up this piece of gear, I'd really love it to come through so I can play with it. <laughs> oh, man. I got to think about that. Uh, I mean, yeah, if anybody has a Kemper, sure, come bring it out. Um, <laughs> you know, a digital quantum or, oh, you know, oh, why yeah. not? I mean, any, well, actually, we we haven't got, we we haven't received a lot of like, recent Digico stuff. I mean, we've had like one or two. Um, actually, I think I, I, I can only think of just one. Um, the rest of them have been like the older, the D1s and the D5s, which are, you know, they're great boards, but man, they're heavy. Um, yeah. So I don't know, maybe a fun Digico or, so, you know, uh, actually, uh, what about an SSL? Let, let's, sure. let's get an SSL let's live through there. Yeah. And um, I know of two of them in Chicago. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I do remember that them uh, wanting to move forward from those. Great. If yeah. anybody listening has an SSL, you're just tired of. Come on by. Let Church Gear yep. pick it up. Yeah. We'd, we'd be happy to do it. Happy to do it. My favorite is like when we're unloading all of this gear from a truck, you know, some of it's pretty heavy. It's like, oh, all right, here we go. And the best part of unloading for me is when I hear that, ooh, like it's so authentic. <laughs> like when it's not I, a sound effect. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's I'm I I've heard Brian's soul leap out of his body somewhere, and I know he just found something he's gonna enjoy a lot. It's when he gets it's like he gets tickled, but it's his goose spot. So somebody, you know, this gear gooses him. He's like, oh. <laughs> It's like now I'm the Pillsbury Doughboy, I guess. <laughs> the Pillsbury <laughs> Gear Boy. <laughs> Pillsbury Gear, Gear Boy. Boy. Yes, okay. there you go. Uh, get that trademarked. Um, okay, so before you were here, though, you had, I mean, 5,000 radio programs, mm -hmm. um, syndicated TV show. Like, that's some high-stakes production that's getting seen by a lot of people. Um, I mean, what was that What was that like just in general? And also, was it a lot of pressure mixing all that? Like, I see that, and I, I just look at stress in my mind. I mean, we had a great team at... at um, uh, we had a great team there. So I, I can't, I do not claim that we, I did all of it. I did not. I, sure, I you sure. know, there was, there was at least two, sometimes three or four of us involved in, in the production of all of that stuff. Um, the chief audio engineer of that company that I worked for is, uh, um, an amazing individual. Uh, I, I learned, I could have gone to school for, I mean, an exponential amount of years and I never would have learned as much is in those years that I worked there with that chief audio engineer. Um, Rick is, is just a fantastic individual, um, a wealth of knowledge and uh, a, a firm believer of sharing that knowledge with anybody who will listen. Um, so he's, he's an amazing guy. And uh, it was, we, we had a lot of work. I think what, one of the things I loved about Rick and what I learned from him is if you can get the first one done, there is very, there's a very good way that you could probably like rinse and repeat and just take that audio, drop it in, push it through. And we can do a lot in a very short amount of time. Um, his, his mind works on a different level when it comes to things like that. And so his automation and how he functions and finding the right program that can do the one thing that we needed to do to make everything 10 times faster is that's something he's, he's known to one of his favorite sayings. And I, I can still hear him say this in my mind. He used to always say it, you know, the other option is, and whenever he said that, everybody was just like, we'd lean in because here it comes, you know, here comes the brilliance. You know, it was one of those, you know, the other option is, and inevitably we'd have uh, some new purchase that we had to do, but it saved everybody time and energy. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, podcast was a lot of fun. I did, I was a sound designer, the recordist and recording engineer, the dialogue. I did all of it. I did all of the, the tech side of that podcast. And that was brilliant fun with some amazing kid actors. Um, and, uh, and an amazing team, um, of directors, producers, and things that we got to work with writers. Uh, and we created, yeah, we had like four plus seasons of that. That was super fun. That was an extreme challenge because the sound design of all of that was, it was very, it was a futuristic kind of podcast, um, where we had, uh, kids flying back in time to watch Bible stories happen. And, um, and it was great. It was good fun, but, uh, um, you know, what, what does, what, what does the parting of the Red Sea sound like? Like that's as a sound designer, that's the way you have to think of things. Like, how can I make this sound to where your mind's eye hears it 
and understands what I'm trying to get you to see. Well, I think what you do is hit that carbon mixer. That's right. With the spring That's reverb. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's your sound design right there. I mean, I wanted to go to Universal Studios and like, you know, look at how they did the old Charlton Heston version of that and like watch them split the water. But it turns out it was, you know, smaller than this table we're sitting at. So that didn't help any. It does sound um, very tough to have to imagine what does this sound like? that I've never heard. And also what does everyone think it sounds like? Cause now you're having to guess the thoughts of millions. Yeah. I mean, it, it, but it, it, it's a challenge creatively, but oh man, it's fun. Like it was, I think that was some of the most fulfilling stuff that I did those years. And uh, to throw in a star Wars reference, cause our audience loves star Wars. Oh yeah. I mean, just think of the fact that to make the sound for the, you know, the laser guns in yep. star Wars, you have to not only imagine how do I make the sound, but I had to imagine what does the human ear, because lasers don't actually make a sound. No. Nope. What does a human brain think a laser sounds like? Yeah. And then make that sound. Yeah. I love all of those Star Wars stories, by the way. Um, I won't go into them, but man, it, every one of the major sounds from the you know from Star Wars was created basically by accident. It was the sound designer trying something, not it not working, and then him like leaning up against something and hearing it and going, oh, that could work. I mean, every one of them, the, the, the lightsaber sound, the, the, um, you the know, the tie the, fighters are the terrifying one to me. Yeah. Like when they come in, even though they never win, they sound when they come in, like you're, you're about to die. It's over there. They've got you. All of those, all of those sounds were, were created by, I mean, basically you can almost say the godfather of sound design, you know, when it comes to Ben Burt and, um, what he did back in those days. Uh, and, you know, none of it digital, but it's fun because he did the sound design for Star Wars. I think it was Indiana Jones as well. Um, my favorite, though, and my curveball of all of it was uh, he did the sound design for Wally. In fact, the the, the Pixar movie Wally, he was actually the the voice of Wally. He basically did his like he did his rough cut. He did a rough cut. He demoed his voice with the with the way he wanted it to sound, and the director's like, "Fine, you just do it." And so he did the voice of Wally in it. It's. So Fantastic. they took him out of the booth and put him on stage. Yeah, exactly. Hey. You need to be on both sides of the glass. That's what he that should is. probably be on the Church Gear podcast. I, oh my! If you get if you get him on here, I'm uh, I have to be another co-host or something. You're not allowed to have him on here without me. <laughs> I'll just fire Blake. Um, it's fine. That's oh, fine. Yeah. For, for a day. That's and good. We'll just yeah. trade jobs. I'll edit the podcast. You host. It'll be oh, great. Oh man, perfect. How right. can we hand over editing of the podcast <clears throat> of the fa grandfather of? Sound design to Blake to ruin it, or maybe we could just convince him to edit it while he's here. Oh, there you go. Oh, wow. That would be amazing. probably take him like three minutes. Yeah, probably. last time I heard, I think he was still at Skywalker Sound. He's one of the principals there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's man, all those stories are amazing. Um, okay, one last thing before we get to the tech takeaway. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems to be a recurring theme that theme that like once you start volunteering in church, you'll learn it real fast, you dive into it, suddenly it's like, why go to college? I'm gonna. I'm, I've got like full-time offers. This is a tough one for you, but I, I I think that this is a need to answer. Like I have an answer for this question. If you were, you know, in high school, senior, or maybe your second year of college, your first year, and it's like, I'm getting job offers. Like I, I don't want to, what do you, what would you, what advice would you give them? I'm not saying there's a full sale answer because I don't think there is just <laughs> full but sale. as a person. Full sale. Full sale? <laughs> you don't even oh, realize man. what you just said. <laughs> Isn't that a phrase though? Like full sale? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. a yeah. university that teaches sure. tech. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and recording. Um, I mean, that's, that's essentially what happened to me the second time I tried college. Um, I, I tried community college one time for a year. In fact, Toby and I were in some audio classes together. Um, and that was yeah, we were we, ADATs uh, and oh my word, like yeah. the original Pro Tools. Yep, yep. I still have my ADAT tape. You know that from that class? I still have that because we had to do like some random recording and to onto ADAT. And I'm fairly certain I still have that ADAT tape lying your, your around. Your kids are like, "What is this?" Hang well, on. yeah, they don't even know what a VHS is, let alone ADAT. Was the re random recording like Toby singing probably because y'all were doing the band stuff? No, Did we didn't do, do the... it together at that time. Uh, oh, that would have been so amazing I mean, I if can, you yeah. had that. I can get you some high school recordings. That would be amazing. Um, so anyway, I, I tried the junior college for the community college for a year. Um, just didn't didn't like it. And then I landed that touring gig. And so I, I left on tour. Uh, at the end of that tour, I went back into college. I went to Liberty University for a year, go LU. And um, again, same thing, hated it. Just, it just did not like it. But while I was there, I was getting phone calls and I was getting messages from people who needed front of house guys, who needed editors or, you know, just anybody who could do any tech. Uh, I was getting full-time gig offers while I was there. And um, so, yeah, by three-fourths of the year, it was like, 
I don't know if this is really going to work. And then I went to the admissions office and they're like, well, okay, we can sign you up for next year. No problem. We just need $4,000 right now. I'm like, yeah, bye. I went home. And um, so here's, here's my take on college. And I mean, there's, there are jobs and careers that people absolutely have to go to college for. If you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be a teacher, you're going to do, you know, those kinds. Yes. A hundred percent go to college, spend the time, spend the money, do it right, do it well. Um, you know, for tech, um, you know, I, I actually, I have a friend of mine who went to Full Sail. He went, he graduated through Full Sail. Um, he did an internship up in New York, I think it was. I mean, he did all of that. And when it was done, uh, when he was all done with the internships and everything else in New York, um, I mean, he went to work at, I think it was DHL. Like, you know, he was doing shipping management stuff. And then, but then we hired him as uh, in the um, broadcast company that I worked for. And uh, he came in and, and he, knew Pro Tools well enough and recording and and it was good. And he had some, some of the things that he learned were beneficial, but it was really interesting because here's a full sale grad who like, I, it just, it didn't set him apart from anybody who sat in front of Pro Tools for, you know, um, any good amount of time had the same experience. And, and I, and I love this dude. I mean, if he hears this, John, I love you. Um, you're an amazing guy, an amazing editor. Um, I just, I don't think Full Sail was worth well, that time and, and money for it. Because you're so, not making a comment about John. You're making a comment about like how how much that really differentiate him. Yeah, exactly. I, I ask this not to dunk on college at all. I'm literally wearing my college sweatshirt right now. Met my wife in college. It is not Harvard, by the way. It's not. I just <laughs> figured uh, I wear this sweatshirt. I actually used to be my mother-in-law's sweatshirt. She gave it to me. Yeah. I love it. Um I only wanted to mention that just because if I was in tech, um, especially in those younger years, you get very little guidance, I think, society as a whole on how necessary college is. And so if you're getting job offers and it's going well, you know, maybe it's not it's not 100 percent necessary. I mean, I tell you, a, a, a kid in junior high or high school that is volunteering at their church, if their tech director there has the teaching heart and has that love of lifting others up. That guy could set that kid on a path for a, for an entire lifetime career before they're out of high school. Yeah, like, and again, I've got a bar none. Yeah. I've got a buddy who went to full sale, loves it. Yeah. I think he's already been on the pod. Not saying college is bad at all. We're just saying it's not it's not a must. Just want to throw that out there. It's a per, that's a personal thing. It, it's yeah. a personal preference. Yeah, a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah. Well, Brian, um, it's now time for the tech takeaway of the day. Tech takeaway. Yeah, I'm going to start vamping here to tell you what it is, but you already know what it is. So really, I can't vamp that long. Sure. But essentially, it could be philosophical. It could be technical. A, a duct tape solution, like something you... Duct tape is the solution. <laughs> it's not a solution. Yeah. Let's get that straight. The more uh, like horror stories I hear in a crazy live production setting, like moments from people, I'm like, I can't believe this all works. And I'm almost just want like a documentary crew following them around of all the crazy things that broke and how did they fix it? It's, oh, it's insane to me that I've done so many shows that, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, good. Maybe, maybe you have one then as the takeaway. Well, I mean, okay. The takeaway and I, well, a quick story about like falling apart and then the takeaway, it takes two seconds. I did a show recently um, in, uh, Indianapolis, um, the company that was doing all of, was supplying all of the gear uh, was out, I think out of Knoxville or something. And um, anyway, we're unloading the whole truck and we realize the rack that should have all the wireless microphones in it never made it on the truck. So we were a day away from production and it was like no wireless mics. So that's the kind of stuff that happens that you have to just, and it's great because when you work with good guys and you work with, and these guys were excellent. I mean, they were so top-notch guys. They, um, they just all kind of shrugged. Like nobody lost it. Nobody freaked out. It was like, hmm. Do you have to use dial up? No. Uh, they, there was another, they had another show in Dallas that was wrapping up. I think it was Dallas. If I remember, maybe it was Oklahoma city. Anyway, they had another show that was wrapping up that day. Um, and they told those guys, Hey, throw your wireless uh, in a truck and drive it to us. And it showed up the, you know, the next morning. So that's, but it was one of those, like those kind of things happen on every live show that you do the big ones. Um, but the tech takeaway here's uh, that was a quick tyrant. Um, my, my tech takeaway is, is mostly de dedicated is dedicated uh, is directed. <laughs> <laughs> to Most the kids out there are, that are yeah. listening. This Brian's about to do a, to a sponsor ad, like dedicated yeah. to, we don't have sponsors. Come on. Right. Um, 
they'll never mind. I won't go there. Um, so my tech takeaway is is more directed for the tech directors, and and it's in the same vein of of the story I just told. Every Sunday, something's going to go wrong. It just will. I mean, whatever piece of gear that has been working flawlessly for who knows how long will just decide that it doesn't care. And it will, it's not going to work that day. You know, that kind of stuff's going to happen every time, every Sunday. I mean, if you don't have a problem on a Sunday morning, I mean, you better get on your knees in front of the altar and, and thank the good Lord before you leave, because that is, that is a rarity. That is a rarity. So, um, yeah, always remember to handle those situations with grace and patience. Um, and remember that the tech is only a, I don't know. It's, it's a, it is a, like a, what, what am I thinking of? It's like the, it's like a secondary role. You know, it, it's not, it's not the main character of the Sunday morning. You, you are a support role. Everything we do in tech is support. And so if that doesn't work, you either patch around it, figure out a way around it. If you can't, okay, that Sunday, you just don't have that. No big deal. No big deal. I mean, it's okay. We're going to go about our Sunday morning. We're going to do the best we can with what we have. And we're going to make it look and sound excellent. Most times, unless it's a major, major issue, the congregation's not going to know any different. It doesn't, nobody's going to know a difference, you know, um, unless you have something major like, oh, we got a projector that just dumped out. Like now we only have one side. Okay. You have one projector. God's still going to move. It's not like, you know, the Holy Spirit. I don't like to crane my neck. Uh, well, I understand that. And you're going to get u- ugly complaints from your congregants. And I tithe, so I expect that uh, projector okay, to here we go. The tithing here thing. we go. Yeah. Toby being the toxic tither. <laughs> Do you have your uh, your nameplate on your pew as well in the, in the exact uh, we corner? We sit in chairs, but yes, I have my nameplate. You have. You have yes. exactly the ones you sit in. Yes. I go to church with Toby. I've never seen this nameplate. I will be checking now. <laughs> But uh, I mean, that's, but that's it. You're, you're going to have to deal with the congregants at times. But I mean, if you have one Sunday with only one projector, you got a Sunday with one projector. It's not like the Holy Spirit's looking above you going, oh, that, sorry, you don't have two projectors. I'm out. Like that, it's not that important. It's important. We want to do the best we can, but it's not the most important thing in the room. I mm, we'll love that. Just good perspective, and I, I really have no idea how y'all do it as techs. I am such a planner. I got to know everything's – my ducks are in a row, and I hit the button, and they all walk off. And so the thought of something just breaking at random is terrifying <laughs> to me. Yeah, don't get into tech, Blake. Yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> wait. <laughs> I think that's kind of the thing. Oops. It's like I'm getting in, but I'm not. But oh, oh man, I don't yeah. know. Some days I uh, contemplate volunteering. I So before I joined the middle school ministry, I just about – Join the tech one, and I thought, what if I don't tell the guys, and I just learn all this, and then I'll two years later, I'll (laughs) surprise them. Blake, it's going to take you like two hundred years. But you know what? I got a salad today. I'm gonna make it those two hundred. Anyways, there you go, Brian. Man, thanks for coming on the show, dude. I I can't thank you enough. Thanks for having me on, Blake. I wonder if anybody listening today is literally googling. Does Seth Rogen work at Church Gear? Oh, I, I mean, I'll save you the Google. You don't have to. He does work here. I mean. We had on our own producer. Do you think he has like just a voice effect that makes him sound like Seth Rogen? I think actually saying he was our producer was how we hid the fact that it was Seth Rogen. And you know what Seth Rogen loves, Toby? Uh, a, a good inappropriate comedy? Yep. And he likes to watch those comedies with his laptop open, getting the early service. He likes to get that early service at 845 Monday morning. I don't know why that's so funny to you too, but I, I watched... TV and work at the same time sometimes? Come on, are you, you guys are not (laughs) are we gonna cut this? (laughs) Thanks for listening and hey, congratulations on Surviving Sunday. If you happen to make it through next Sunday as well, join us again for your weekly Tech Breather.